Oh, BBC Wales. Dear Chris, we liked your last offering, Wales and the Five Other Nations, open brackets, the story so far, close brackets. Can you do it again this year? Only this time, change the title to something shorter. P.S. If you don't blow the budget, you can get to go to one of the games too. But you do need a good title sequence. Mm. Cost of title sequence, seven pence. Right, plan for the next half hour. Meet a Welsh rugby legend, an English rugby legend, blag my way into a game at the Millennium Stadium and a quick visit to HQ to feel the vibe before the England game. The moment Big Ben chimes away the new year, I can't wait for the Six Nations to start. And it's fair to say, like all Welsh people, when I'm watching a game, I get involved. My producer knew this and thought it would be a good idea to watch me watching the island game. Live. Keep still and stay in your chair, he said. But I think he was taking the mick. Come on! No! Well done, female. Now, Lou, give him shoe pie! Go on, George North! It's got to be a try! I can't see how that's going to be given, though. No, well, you're Irish. Of course you can't. I hate that when they show highlights and it stops them. Yes! Great try! He's holding on, ref. That's our penalty. Shocker. Oh, the gap. Ireland have got something better than a penalty. Rory back for the try. Tommy will be on the game. And the lead grows to eight points. Ah. It's all a bit predictable. Yes. Great kick off, Benny. Come on, come on, get this line out. Go on, John North. Great pass! Yeah! Awesome! Boom! What a brilliant try. Keep the momentum now. Go on, hooky. Ship it on, Toby. Get hold of him. You've got to squeeze. Good tackle, George North. Having a slug of water. Bannon, the lead. <laughs> what the hell are you doing, Bradley Davis? You need to get people in there, you idiots. Here we go. Hands. Jonathan Yes. Yes. Keep playing, boys. Keep playing. That's a great. Go on, Jamie Robert. Get over him. Be patient. Get over him. He's held there. Come on, get over him. Keep playing. Yes. Come on. It's a penalty. This is a match. Kick. Yes! The referee's whistle will go. Yes! What a game. But for the national papers, it was all about England. And let's face it, against Scotland, they hardly set the world alight. I mean, look at this. It's Monday, and there's a double-page spread on the England game, which was on the Saturday, and yet Wales is a game that was on a Sunday, half a page. Still, at least the Western Mail's more interested. How many pages they got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They must have loads of people writing for them. Oh, no, that's a thought. With Delmi Parfit as my mentor, the Western Mail gave me my chance. 350 words on the Wales-Scotland game, I was told, I had to deliver by nine o'clock. But that's all I was told. What sort of words and exactly how to do it was still a bit of a mystery. And this was a very different sort of writing to what I was used to. I mean, for a start, you couldn't just make stuff up. We were sat in the press box amongst all the journos, and I was out of my depth. Five minutes into the game, what I needed was advice from one of the most experienced and well-respected rugby journalists in Wales. What have you written down so far? Um, Wales, Wales versus Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got the teams right. Brilliant. John's got a computer. Why have you just got a pad? Well, I mean, I'm not filing urgently, so I mean, I can afford to just make notes and, and bash it out in the office. I've written like 
phrases to get in, you know. Time, he had so much time, he could have texted home to say how well he was doing. Do you know what I mean? Like phrases like that. Is that kind of... I might, I might, st that add? I might steal that. Actually. I might put that in mine. No. I'm getting that in somewhere. <laughs> You don't want to put too many of them in, though. Okay. It becomes like a, an episode of Blackadder. Then <laughs> he twisted and turned like a twisty, turny thing. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want that. Dominant. He was as dominant as a cat general in a mouse army. What do you think? That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's that's, uh, that's a that's a candidate. But Delmi's politeness wasn't going to help me hit my deadline. I needed answers. Now, seriously, how much do I need to be writing down? And, and what do you write down? No, you, you don't write down everything that you see. The least you need to do is keep a record of the score as it unfolds. Nice. Jotting down some phrases associated with players as well, right? Jamie Roberts, like a really good-looking ogre on a rampage to a hobbit village. But he hasn't done it yet, has he? I wish he'd do it just so I can put that line in. Why don't you nip on and tell him? <laughs> I think they're going to score, yeah? And they'll have deserved it. Oh, at the end of the first half, at 3 all, from the press perspective, it had been a bit uneventful. Not a heck of a lot to write about. And from a fan's perspective, it had been, well, wobbly. Just get the ball and kick it off. But luckily, the second half was a different story. And from my position in one of the best seats in the house, I started to get unprofessional. Come on. Go on, Jamie Roberts. Sit down, you idiot. You're supposed to be a hard-nosed journalist. Great try. How many minutes? 42, 42 minutes. 42. OK, now write something down. Patient build-up, going through the structure. Yeah, phases. Just phases, phases better. Ah, oh, some more like it. How many minutes? 44 minutes. Hims and Ardy is right out. Stuff worth noting down was starting to happen. And then, Jamie Roberts delivered. Oh, there we go, I can put my line in! There he was, like yeah. a good-looking ogre charging through a hobbit village. That's a green light for that one. It was all happening, with the likes of Lee Halfpenny starting to make my job a whole lot easier. I'm tempting fate if I give him the conversion now. Yeah, it would be, yeah. I'm going to write it down now. All right. Lee Halfpenny, try plus con. <laughs> now, how do you come up with a headline? You need the copy. You've got a feel for, for the piece. Forwards and backs were having a ball, culminating in Lee Halfpenny's second try. Oh. I won't be giving him this conversion before he kicks it, because this is slightly different. I will, I'll give him this one before he kicks it. See, I told you. If you stick with me, you'll be fine. Job done, Wales. Job barely started, Corcoran and Parfit. Oh, good, a bit harsh. How about Giant? I had about an hour and a half to knock up 350 words. Sounds easy? Time pressure makes it a lot harder. Right, here we go. Uh, words, fine. Notes, what are they? No idea. Concentrate. Um, any good? Rubbish. I don't think he missed a kick either, did he? One kick. He did miss one kick. He missed one kick. Got to be accurate. Oh, God, people are leaving. Come on! Right, OK. This young Welsh team and their coaches feel special and on the brink of doing something to match their talents. Finished. It's a top effort, mate. Yeah? For a first goal, yeah. Really nice piece. Oh, thanks. But I'd gone over my word count. Was it going to fit? Oh, yeah, it was fine. In fact, I was far too pleased with myself.
like a giant rampaging through a hobbit village. I was on a roll, and when on a roll, why not do the obvious thing? Text someone famous. Hi, Will Carling. You don't know me, but I feel like I know you, like an old friend. Stroke, hated adversary. Fancy a coffee? Best wishes, Chris. Little kiss. Come on, Hill! Back in the day when the world was black and white and this was the height of luxury travel, the Twickenham trip was the trip abroad. And it really was abroad, as the Seven Bridge wasn't even built and the car ferry was the equivalent of the M4. Come on, Di, put your foot down. Shut up, you nutter. It's too expensive. Petrol's 5p a gallon. And there's a song about this trip that's as popular now as it was way back in the olden days. Well, the 70s. We paid our weekly shilling for that last Twickenham trip. A long weekend in London, I without a bit of kip. And oh, there's a seat reserved. There's a seat reserved for beer by the boys from Aberkan. There's beer, pontoon, crisps and fags and a croquin' call on land. And we were singing hymns and arias. The next verse starts into Paddington Weeded Road. Into Paddington Weeded Road. But to tell this story properly, what I really need is one of those massive showbiz coincidences where I actually bump into Max Boyce himself. Max Boyce. Oh, there we are. Cocky. <laughs> well, it doesn't get much better than this. A chat with a Welsh rugby legend in a first-class carriage, where I'm told you can get free biscuits. Welsh comedy and rugby legend uh, and writer of legendary hymns and arias song. Tell me, how did it all start? Because it's still it's bigger than ever. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I wrote it when I was started out in, as a like folk singer in the folk club in, in Valley Folk in Ponderawa. But little did I think it would, it would still be sung some 30 years later. So were those famous lyrics based in reality? Uh, we, we collected every week the, the in, in the local colliery we had a, like a trick of a trip, like a you know like a, a club card and we paid in and it was showed how much I paid in over the months wow. and it was a shilling and I always wonder why I started that song with we paid our weekly shilling for that January trip. It's yeah. fine for all sorts. Let's always remember this guy Mervyn Briggs and we had to put right everybody you now. Put five fingers up. All those are going to. All those are going to check it. And moving, he only had four fingers, so he was fined every week. For, he paid for about two or three of us to go to check it. Planted leeks and dragons. Looked for, looked for toilets all around. So many there we couldn't budge. Twisted legs and pale. I'm ashamed we used a bottle of that once held. My favourite hymns and arias moment were. Oh, hang on, free stuff. Please, coffees, waters. Okay, uh, crisps. Yes, please. Yes, it's fruit cake. Thank you. And um, we'll get a biscuit. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Anyone? Was before the England game in Wembley in 1999. Well, let me show you this. Right. And it always makes me teary. <laughs> Oh, the memories of this. Because it's still my favourite line. <laughs> we have defeated England. Do you like watching yourself back? No, no. <laughs> it. I never, I've never watched any of my programmes. But they sounded both the same. We sympathised with an English friend whose team was doomed to fail. So we gave him that old bottle. Listen to that, 80,000 people. Well, in London. Has that ever been Nowhere sung there. along with it brilliantly? Oh, it was a lovely sunny day. And, 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 the end, and, you know, you couldn't have scripted it that way. The London Welsh Choir back in the end, Tom Jones, yeah, in 80,000. Yeah. I mean, he was there 
Nice. Yeah. So what are your memories of leading into the performance then? Be, you know, well, were you I nervous? Very, I was very, very nervous because the occasion and Tom Jones and all that. And, and it was so difficult. Nobody realised how different it is in the great 80,000 people just to sing on your own. And, and, and I was singing the song and, and, and all the English players were on the field and they were running past me, passing and kicking. <laughs> and, and Matt Dawson comes right up me and says, my mother loves you. <laughs> <laughs> Before the England Wales game. <laughs> I went, how I, how I kept going, I'll never know. That's true. And then I reminded Max about another great moment. See if you remember this. Uh, 2008 Grand Slam oh, game, yeah, first yeah, game yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And listen. Swing low gives way to Hinson Arias. <laughs> what is going on here in Twickenham? It's a remarkable Welsh comeback. That was a humbling. Uh, I, I did it sing at Cardiff. I never thought I'd hear this sing like at Twickenham. As you say, a magical moment, you know, and it was, uh, uh, the game changed and they wanted to express what they felt and, and they used the song to express it. Oh, more biscuits. Oh, brilliant. Hiya. Can we have some more biscuits, please? Yes, anyone? That'd be great, yes. Um, I'll have the uh, chocolate ones, please. That'd be great, yeah. I'll have a uh, oat crunch, please. I don't like them. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> You've got to ask me now, is there anything else? Yes, can I have some biscuits? I've never done first class. <laughs> I tell you what, we can go to Sally's and we get a party there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're taking that we can. So, come on in. Are you looking forward to this game coming up? The England game? Yeah. Yeah, every game is, you know, every game is wonderful, the Six Nations. And, uh... Oh, I'm sorry, Max. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's a text from Will Carlin. Look, hi, Corky. Sure, pop round. On the 93 Lions tour, I shared a room with Scott Gibbs, the man who kept me out of the test team, so it won't be the first time I've had a Welshman that had a laugh at my expense. I'll put the kettle on, Will. Big kiss. Aww. Oh. Hey, listen, I'm going to have to go. Sorry, Max. Right. No, no problem. Right. That's right. Brilliant. Give me the guards. Hello. This is... You have to kiss. Will Carling, a man who, at the age of 22, took the England captaincy and turned them from perennial losers into Grand Slam winners. And the man who, in the 90s, Welsh rugby fans loved to hate. Probably because he didn't smile much and had a bum chin and a mullet and, well, everyone just thought he was a bit of a... Everyone thought he epitomised English arrogance. But on first impressions, he was all right, as he made me a coffee in his kitchen that was the size of heroin and he told me about his first time at the Arms Park. Most of my time was spent thinking, geez, this is where Edwards played and J.P.R. Williams and... And it was just like, this was the arms park. Yeah. But then we lost, so it took a bit of an edge off it, really. So what was that like going into that cauldron first time out then? I mean, and if you were captain, that, with that sort of responsibility... We went out, it was pouring with rain, and Rob Jones basically kicked, box kicked us to death. You know, yeah. Tactics, worst that's great, and we were gone. We got beaten. And uh, for me, I remember I drove back the next day, stopped in the first service station, got some drink, got some whatever, and there were obviously coach loads of Welsh supporters. And they had obviously clocked me. And when I came back out of the shop, they had made this tunnel all the way out. <laughs> and, and the abuse I got walking down this tunnel was unbelievable. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I remember getting in my car. Obviously, I can't repeat, because it's a family, but I just remember thinking, yeah, not next time. Really? Yeah. I thought you were going to say they clapped you through, but no. No, no, no. 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 Because, you know, right, it was time to get out the questions from my mates about England players of his generation. Yeah. When you played, was Dean Richards the laziest player in training, as one would assume? Yes. <laughs> he was? Yes. He used also, at the start, you know, we'd get in the changing rooms, right? Most guys, you'd get in the changing room an hour and a bit before, everyone had their sort of warm-up routines, this, that and the other. Dean would sit down, fully dressed, would get out the paper and would do the crossword. <laughs> and he would, honestly... And you'd sit opposite me, Twickenham, and about 15, 20 minutes to go, I'd have to say to him, you know, I'd be in my kit, I'd have warmed up, you know, I'd go, Dino, 15 minutes. And he would go, put the paper down, put his pen down, eventually sort of put all his kit on, socks would, he wouldn't even pull his socks up. Might touch his toes, probably not, <laughs> all, not all the way down, <laughs> and would go out and be, would be brilliant. But that would be him. He'd sit and do the crossword. Was he the hardest guy you played with or against? I th always think winter's, winter bottom was probably... Yeah? Yeah. When I first started playing in, in England, we, we played the South West, and I got caught in this rug, and the South West, it was John Hall's Chilcot, you know. 
And they were kicking me to death, right? Obviously thinking, you know, who's, who's the new kid? Give him some. And I looked out and there was Winterbottom, and my hero and my teammate standing about two yards away, just looking at me like that. And I'm thinking, and eventually it stopped, the whistle went, and I got up and walked off. And, and as I walked past him, he went, well done. <laughs> right. And I turned to look at him, I went, huh? he went, don't ever make a noise, mate. Just encourages them. So growing up as a kid then, who were your rugby heroes? My rugby heroes were all, all the Welsh boys. JPR, Gareth Edwards, Phil Bennett. It was when I was about eight, I think, my dad had to break the news to me that, that I was English. And we played in white and lost. <laughs> right, well, I've got some of your greatest rugby moments here that I just wonder if you could just talk us through. Ready? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, this is, this is, this is a great... This is special. This is... People don't understand skill, see? Look at that, being able to run. <laughs> and push. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great try. It's a great try. I was very grateful to you for that try because I drew you in the sweepstake. So externally, I was like, oh, no! And internally, I was like, that. yes. How much like, do you win? 45 quid. <sighs> OK, just talk us through this one as well. Yeah. Talk us particularly on the tackling. It was, uh, yeah, I'm you? not sure what was going on. Look. Look, yeah, I know. No, but it was like, oh dear. It was just sheer fear. Like, oh, oh, keep away from me. <laughs> and who was the guy? Was it Alan? Was it? He tried to get me with his knees, didn't he? And uh, luckily he missed. There. In fairness yeah, to you, that yeah. is a great finish. <laughs> but the tackling was was uh, some things you just can't stop. <laughs> this one, I'm going to give you a chance to commentate over. Well, right. So you're Eddie Butler for this. And and Carlin going on the outside. He's he's. My God, he's got past Hunter. What's, what's happened to Hunter? It's like, and here he is. Yeah, this is going to be a great try from Carling. Cross comes Woodhouse. Oh, no, he's held him up. Oh, no one likes to see this, do they? We do. <laughs> the, the little pork has been held up and he's... <laughs> <laughs> and he's dumped over the dead ball line. <laughs> and that is quite remarkable. I thought the last thing I could do with you is if you ask me some questions. Right. Uh, and I thought if we do it as a little mastermind setup. So I prepared you some questions, right? So, so you, you're it, Magnus. I'm Magnus. Welcome to Will Carling Mastermind. Can we have our first contestant, please? Name? Chris Corcoran. Correct. Occupation? Broadcaster and comedian. <laughs> Occupation. <laughs> Maybe just leave that as broadcaster. You <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, you have to be like... Let's go again. <laughs> Shut up, we're going again. We're not doing that. Right. Specialist subject? The good sport and rugby legend that is Will Carling. Correct. The legend and the... Yeah. Chris, your time on the rugby legend and good sport that is Will Carling starts now. Who was the rugby union centre who became the youngest ever England captain at the age of 22? Will Carling. Correct. Who, during his time in the army, rose to the rank of second lieutenant of the Royal Regiment of Wales? Will Carling. Correct. According to Wikipedia, whose team was criticised for relying on their forwards and not passing the ball out to the backs? Will Carling. Correct. Who, despite playing that way, led England to three grand slams in the 90s? Will Carling. Correct. Who has a social networking page about him called Will Carling Fan Club that has on it only three comments and was last updated in 2002? Oh, Will Carling. Correct. Who is the greatest... Sorry, I've started, so I'll finish. Who is the greatest England centre of all time? Jeremy Gascott. Correct. <laughs> and at the end of that round, Chris, you've scored six points and just like the four dominated teams I used to captain in the 90s, no passes. <laughs> I think it's sad when someone laughs at their own little pre-prepared <laughs> prepared jokes. <laughs> it turned out Will Carling was a top bloke. You see, that's rugby union for you. So, to Saturday's triple crown game with England at Twickenham. We've only won here twice in 25 years. It's a big, cold, open stadium. A relentless chill wind can suck the energy from you. A ghost of the cold-hearted dominance from the era of Back, Delalio and Johnson. But that era has gone. This is a big game on Saturday. Were starting as favourites, but it wasn't quite the same in 2008. England had just lost in the final of the World Cup, and Wales had gone out to Fiji in the group stages. And this was Warren Gatland's first game. Listen to Jerry Guscott now. I get the impression, Jerry, that you are supremely confident. I am confident. New coach, new team. Uh, I think it'd be 20, 20 points difference. 
to sign the Prince of the World Cup final. Here they open the RBS Six Nations at home. And for the first half, it looked like Jerry was going to be right. They kicked the penalty and then they started making breaks like this. Dangerous run by the England wing. Great run into the 22. Shane Williams goes back. Hook goes down, still chaos. And then English outside half started knocking out Welsh flankers. And then they scored a try. It was a bit of a nightmare. In fact, so dominant with England in that first half that the only highlight for Wales was Mark Jones narrowly avoiding getting his head taken off by giant hairdo Leslie Vinacolo. Second half, kind of more of the same, really. England got off to a good start, kicked the penalty. So they were 19-6 up at this point. But then, once BBC had started faffing around with their spider cam, Hookie kicked the penalty, so brought it back to 99. And then something weird happened because we started doing stuff, like Henson's break here, which was a, a cracker. And then England started, I don't know, something went wrong. Something weird happened here in West London. And they all started panicking and faffing about, like the Chuckle Brothers in reverse, and started playing in the wrong direction. To, to you. To, to me. To you. To me. To you. Go on, Gomez. Which led to another penalty. So that was 1912. And then even Johnny Wilkinson started panicking and chucking the sort of passes that you'd be gutted if you threw in an under nines match. He's caught the fever. Saki and Cipriani in trouble. Shanklin's nailed him. Goffey's coming in. It's a cracking turnover, which ultimately put us in the position that led to this try, set up by James Hook and scored by Lee Byrne. Lee Byrne. And the conversion would bring the scores level. And just at that moment, in West London, Welsh people started to believe. And swing low gives way to hymns and arias. What is going on here at Twickenham? It is a remarkable Welsh comeback. Lots of time left. This to level the scores. Yes. Brilliant by Hook. And then seconds later, this happened. Straight off the kickoff. Mike Phillips charged down a Bolshaw. Gets in brilliantly, scoops it up, keeps his head, flings it out. Mike Phillips scores in the corner with Alwyn Jones taking out Ian Bolshaw again. Back to Phillips! Wales, have they scored? Back to Fantastic, and we were on the roll. The game had totally flipped round, literally in scoring wise, in the space of like 30 seconds. And then Dead Eye Hooky nails the conversion. Takes us to 1926. So Wales were on a massive roll. I mean, essentially they'd won the game. Fans were going bananas. And England needed to. <laughs> Sean Edwards, an Englishman, started bossing other Welsh people around. I don't know what he was telling Jenks, but we loved it. And England needed to score to try to get a, a, a draw. And they fluffed it. And everyone knew that. Let's play spot the Welshman here. Watch, watch this. Now look at Howley. Have we won, boys? Oh, boys, we haven't won. Oh my God, we won! Brian Ashton looked like a man who'd lost his dog. And Warren Gatlin went on and took the 2008 Grand Slam. Sat here in 2012, I don't get a sense of foreboding, just anticipation. I think we should simply come here and win. Good luck, boys.